welcome to Furious Driving and today I'm at the wheel of Suffolk's greatest sports car. Yes, this is a Trident Ventura. This car is currently or about to be at auction next week, I believe. So if you want to see the opportunity to buy this very car, then hit the link in the description. Now, if you like reviews of interesting and unusual vehicles, then do please hit like and subscribe. And now on with the review. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving. And you know I like an oddity on this channel. They don't come much broader in terms of rarity than this, the Trident Clipper Ventura V6. One of only, well, 80 Tridents ever built and only about 30-ish of the Venturas ever created as well. A properly, properly rare car, something of a unicorn. If you're looking for an unusually rare British sports car of very, very low volumes indeed. Well, let's take a look at this thing and well, try and figure out what it is. Now, Trident themselves began in 1966 with an inauspicious beginning. The Clipper had been an attempt to take TVR up market. They wanted to do a V8 powered, steel bodied, exciting high end car, a carrosseria kind of a car they could charge more money for to a higher class of clientele. However, TVR have had the occasional money issue over the years, and this is one of those times. So, as part of the bankruptcy thing, one of their dealers took on the Clipper project and it became the Trident Car Company. And the original Trident was based on an Austin Healey chassis with an AC Cobra 289 cubic inch V8. So it was going to be something of an animal and also something of a bargain at a thousand pounds less than an AC Cobra. So in theory, it had everything going for it. Now, typical of small, independent, low volume British sports car manufacturers, there were money issues and things went up and down. But in 1969, they came back with a second model, this one, the Ventura, which is basically the same body, but no longer intended to be a steel car. This is a glass fiber, fiberglass body, and it's no longer got the V8, it has got a V6, a Ford SX 3 litre V6, no less, coupled to a four speed manual gearbox. So, although it's less powerful, it is a very, very fun thing to drive still. The other big change, of course, is that it's no longer sitting on an Austin Healey chassis. It's now using a Triumph TR6 chassis, which has the advantage it's now got independent suspension on all four corners. However, they had to weld in an extra five inches of steel to make the wheel base the same as it had been on the now unavailable Austin Healey chassis. It's not just me who loves this yellow colour. All of these little bugs are obsessed with it and it's like walking through a swarm, a cloud of the things. Now, anyone who thinks glass fiber is lightweight, they should try lifting the bonnet on one of these cars because that is far from light. Now, it's fascinating seeing the construction of this car because it really does look amazing on the outside. Show car on the outside, but concept car under the skin. Look at this bracing on the bottom of the bonnet to keep it all stiff and not floppy. We've got a weird little cutout, welded angular cutout to go over the alternator just here. The engine is really far back in the chassis, so it should give virtually mid-engine handling. I mean, technically this far back from the axle, it almost could be classed as mid-engine, frankly. The battery is down here above the axle. We've got a radiator pushed out in the front, and then we've still got about sort of 40, ooh, 50 centimeters of space in front of the radiator to the grill down there. This V6 looks absolutely dwarfed in this huge engine bay, which was of course designed for the big American V8. Right, let's get in and have a look at the interior of this thing. It's got lovely padded door cards, but a carpet on the bottom. Not particularly heavy in detail, but nice that it feels padded and a bit premium in that respect. Looking around the car, because they are such a small volume manufacturer, everything is off the shelf from other people. It does become a game of spot the parts bin item. So a uh, little tick for everything you see. Door handles, switch gear, more switch gear, the dials themselves, the clock, the heater controls, the rocker switches, the fuel gauges, the gear shifter, literally everything, even the handbrake, it's all off the shelf from other manufacturers, obviously to keep costs down and make it viable and have good quality components in here. So let's sit inside and see what we think. Now the seats are really very comfortable indeed. You uh, sink quite heavily into this soft centre bit, a very buckety bucket seat with curious 1970s style headrests. Um, only the 70s could produce a thing that looks like that. 
In front of us, we have got a large padded tea shelf, which makes it surprisingly impractical because your cup of tea will topple over very easily indeed. So not the greatest of tea shelves in the world. There's a loudspeaker up there for the radio. This is an audio line, a 1980s special, complete with, oh my goodness me, a graphic equaliser, one of the greatest inventions of the 1980s. And below that impressive padded tea shelf, a luxury tea shelf, we've got a timber dashboard, which may think is out of place in a sports car, but you know, this is meant to be a high-end sports car after all. So we've got a glove box, which is carpet lined for comfort, little eyeball vents, which look, I'm gonna guess from a Mark I Escort probably. Likewise, the fan control, I think looks very, very, very Ford indeed. That's above a nice big clock ahead of the driver, more of this rather nice timber effect stuff, which has got, oh, joy of joys, the crystal topped plastic lensed warning lights. Green for indicators, blue for main beam headlights, red, I'm guessing, for brakes. But those little crystal topped light things are absolutely fabulous. It's one of those tiny, tiny things that just seeing one of those light up takes me back to my childhood, because I remember them from car dashboards in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, they were just everywhere in all kinds of cars. But yeah, we've got a nice clear dashboard, rev counter, no red line, but does suggest up to 8,000 RPM. Speedometer, suggesting up to 160 miles an hour, with oil and ignition warning lights in the bottom there. We've got water temperature and oil pressure on the left, another eyeball vent on the right, and our little ignition key. The steering wheel, not sure what brand it is, but it's a typical 1970s, late 60s sports wheel, which is quite large actually, but does feel nice in your hands. Like padded leather feels really good. Aluminium center and our Trident Ventura logo, and that doubles as the horn. Now we've got more padded stuff in the center, very 19, late 60s, early 70s style of padding everywhere. More wood, fuel, amp gauge, fog lights and things. Electric windows, because we are in posh car heaven here. The aforementioned audio line radio cassette player. Oh, this is something I've not come across before. The flap for the cassette is also the tuner dial, wow. This is a new and exciting innovation. I am properly excited by this. We've got our lighter on the left-hand side for a 12 volt socket. We've got a chrome Britax switch for something on the right. Big ashtray, more padded. And I love how this gear shift is canted forward. So it's always forward in a rather excited manner with what I think is a Triumph overdrive in and out. This tunnel is also home to the handbrake. It's carpeted, it's quite wide. And we've got a tiny rear seat, which is almost usable by small children. So you could argue this is a sensible family sports car if you are really desperate to try and put that one across. Up above, we've got a black vinyl headlining with a sunroof, which I'm not gonna open because I don't dare open sunroofs. I never open sunroofs. This is the Wabasto. And behind us, we've got a little courtesy light. Let's have a little look in the boot and then take it on the road. So before we drive off, let's look in the back of the car. We have got two of these really cool aero style fuel filler caps here so you can dump petrol in doubly quick. We've got rear lights, which I recognize, but I can't think where they're from. Might be Hillman Hunter actually. Drop them in the comments if you recognize these. The big twin exhaust, little bumperettes on the corners, looking absolutely fabulous, very minimalistic, very 1960s, cool. Our trident in very British serif letters and we go to open the boot and um, yeah, that's where we find a slight problem. It's not the ideal shopping car it would appear because they seem to have neglected to put any means of opening into the car. So I guess you have to fold the seats down and uh, hoik that spare wheel over the back seat. That's crazy, that's crazy town. Oh well, I guess there are always compromises. Right, let's get the Trident on the road. You sit in a proper old school, low on the ground, legs straight in front of you driving position, and the pedals feel like they're almost horizontal on the uh, bulkhead. So everything's right out in front of you. And the pedals are quite heavy as well. The clutch, the brake, accelerator, all have a bit of a shove to them. The gear change though, after an initial bit of resistance, is nice and light, flipping between the four ratios. And of course, there's got overdrive on the top as well, if you want that. The steering is not assisted. It, 
and is fairly heavy at low speed. Lightens up as you go along and waits up and waits up nicely through the corners. The engine, that Ford V6, it's got a completely different noise and character to when you feel it in something like a Capri. It's very, very willing, very revvy indeed. And the way it drives is kind of why people would buy it because it's a very, very alive feeling car. It's very connected to the driver in a wonderful way. As you look around it, the styling is really quite exciting and interesting. Designed by a guy called Trevor Fiore, or Flood I think is his real name, who went on to be a design director at Citroen later on. It's very Italian, very cutting edge, quite an exciting design, but when you get close up, it is very much a typical low volume glass fibre kind of thing. Imagine if uh, TVR had their quality control cut. That's kind of where your fit and finish seems to land with the where the doors slam shut and that kind of thing. But it does drive in a really extremely good way. That lack of any driver assistance whatsoever. No ABS, no traction control, not even power steering. I think it's got power brakes, they do stop pretty well. It does make it an exciting thing to be in. It's a proper, proper sports car. Get your teeth into it, throw it around a corner, grab it by the scrap of the neck, that kind of thing. It's guttural and fun. I'm not sure what the 0-60 actually is, but I suspect it feels an awful lot faster than it actually is. Yeah, numbers, production numbers of these things are a little bit confusing. Some people say that there were 31, some say 35. It's hard to actually know because the company went defunct twice. Once in 1974, then it got resurrected from 76 through to 78. So it's kind of hard to really know exactly where they stand. But they think about 80 Tridents were built in total. So mega tiny numbers all round however you want to slice it. It is a booming thing to drive. Loads of fun. I guess it's more focused on a B-road blast or a track day rather than a motorway run. I suspect that loud exhaust might give you a bit of a headache after a while. A tick over, 40 miles an hour with the uh, overdrive clicked in, it's actually pretty civilised. Thing is though, this isn't the kind of car you really want to drive in a civilised manner. This is the kind of car you go out in on the weekend, grab it by the scruff of the neck and ring it. You do feel every bump and jitter though. That is not ironed out for you at all. That Triumph chassis is really, really good. Proper old school British sports car chassis. You can feel the coil springs doing their work. I would say it's definitely an advantage, a big upgrade on the original Austin Healey chassis. The only thing I'm not mad keen on in the way you drive or sit in here is the position of the seat belt. The lap belt section is mounted about halfway up the B post so it comes across your rib cage. So it's a little bit weird. I wonder if you could submarine underneath it if you were in an actual crash. I have to admit I've never taken these low volume sports cars as seriously as I could have done perhaps. I always felt they were trying to do something that had already been done perfectly well by the mainstream manufacturers. Never given them the credit they were due but maybe I need to reevaluate that. Maybe I need to look again at some of these things. There were a lot of these small volume sports car makers using Triumph and other off the shelf parts to do interesting and different things. These guys, Peerless, Warwick, all kinds of people. I'm maybe not giving them enough credit over the years. But perhaps you need to drive a few more of them to really get the feel of what they're about. Something just a bit different from the norm. 
Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this really rather fun, low volume British sports car. There's between 30 and 35 of these built. I don't know how many left. Not many, I would warrant. But yeah, if you've enjoyed this, please do like and subscribe. And if you want to own this car, then head down to the uh, auction in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time driving something completely different. Mm-hmm.